new series called Growth Track. See, we are doing something as a church, and, and I'm excited about it. Today we begin the conversation about something that is very core to what we do here. We call it our growth track. See, during 2013, if, if you're new here this morning, this, this may be a shock to you. But if you've been here for any time, you know this year has been a crazy, crazy year. Amen? Now, y'all got to talk back to me this morning now. Come on. It's been a crazy year. In 2013, we saw things that still are boggling my mind. Outrageous growth rates. Outrageous growth rate, primarily with new believers, people that are just showing up at church and going, hey, what is this Jesus thing all about? Hey, I heard that something's happening at this church. What's happening? I, I want to find out. I just want to stop in and figure it out. God is doing something, and it's not just about people making fresh starts. That's only part of the process. That's where growth track comes in. See, in the future, we're going to be offering classes every single week that are going to be in room 101 and 102. But I, I spent a lot of time praying over going, you know what? This is something valuable. Our entire current church needs to walk through this together. So today we begin a series of conversations where we are going to talk about what it's all about, growth track. That we've got to grow in so many different ways. And today we're going to kick off the conversation talking about the church. Everybody say the church. We're talking about the church this morning. We're talking about the church for a really good reason. Let me tell you why. Because I believe without a doubt in my mind, no no ifs, ands, buts about it, I'm not going to make any excuses. The local church is the hope of the world. Now, you may be here and go, Pastor, that's kind of sacrilegious, dude. What about Jesus? I thought Jesus was the hope of the world. What do you think he's the head of? The church. We are the body of Christ. We are the hands and the feet of the gospel of Jesus. Yes, it's all about Jesus. And a church that's all about Jesus is the hope of the world. It's not more medication. It's not more programs. It's not more systematic approaches. It's all about Jesus. Anybody with me this morning? Am I just talking to myself? It's all about him. So let's talk about our church. Let's talk about some of the core things to First Assembly. Let's talk about the church here local that we get to be a part of. This morning, I want to kind of, kind of break this down for you a little bit. I, I want to teach you. I'm not going to preach as much. If, if you've been here for some time, this month's going to look a little bit different. But what you're going to get this month is some practical resources, some practical information. We want to share this with you, and I want you to grab hold of it. So make sure you take notes this morning. This morning, I want to talk about our purpose. Why do we exist as a church? Well, let me tell you why we exist as a church. To build really big buildings and to pay me a lot of money. Come on, somebody. i just kidding. No, why do we exist as a church? We exist as a church very simply to fulfill the great commandment. If you have your Bibles, Mark chapter 12, verse 30 says this. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Jesus is telling the people the, best, the most important commandments to follow. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Is that Jesus going, well, hey, don't worry about adultery. That's old school. Don't worry about lying and stealing and covetousness and using the names of the Lord and man. That's old school. No, that's not what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying is if you'll focus on loving God and loving people, all the other stuff comes naturally. If you'll focus on these two things, that your purpose, your reason for being is to focus on these. And the other thing we're focused on as well is Christ's purpose. In John 10.10 10, it says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The thief comes to still kill and destroy. But Jesus says, I'm here. Let me tell you why I'm in the house. I'm here so that you may have life and have it abundantly. So we simply say it. You know it. You've said it. You've written it down. Here at First Assembly, in all that we do, in everything that we do, we love God, love people, and love what? We love God, we love people, and we love life in all that we do. It's the reason we live. See, if we would take our priorities and our values and everything that we hold dear to us and hold it up to that, I'm telling you what will happen is mind-boggling. Marriages will come together. Families will come together. Parenting will be so much easier. Life will make sense when we hold it up to that candle. That's why we do what we do. It's our purpose. It's why we exist. That's who we are. But let me tell you how we do it. Our mission as a church is simply this. Our reason for existence is to love God, love people, love life. But the way we move into that is our mission. If, if, you're, a, if you're a military person, you know that when you go into the military, they give you a mission to do. It's, it's called the commander's intent. It's that one line on the paper that says, in all that you do, this is your focus. This is how we complete the mission. This is your part of the mission. 
Well, our part of the mission is this, to lead people to become fully devoted followers of Christ. To lead people to become fully devoted followers of Christ. Now, that does, that what that means is if, if you're here and you've been saved, we've got people here that have walked with Jesus for like 70 years, and that's amazing. And we've also got people in this room who are brand new to Christ and are trying to figure it out. And we have people here this morning that maybe you don't know Jesus. And here you found yourself at first assembly on a, on a Sunday morning trying to make sense of it all. It doesn't matter where you're at. We're always moving forward to become fully devoted followers of Christ. Some of you may be wondering, why, Pastor, why do you have a birdhouse on this stage? Because I like birds. That's why I have a birdhouse. If you were here last Sunday night, we talked about finches. Sunday night, we talked about the fact that if you want finches to come into your yard, you've got to get very strategic, very focused. I asked Bill. I said, Bill, I want you to build me a finch house. So he did a bunch of homework, and he built me a house for finches. And it's cool. I mean, it's got a jacuzzi in there, all kinds of good stuff happening. I asked them to build me a house because it's a reminder for us as a church that why we exist is to strategically and purposefully go after our finches. And our finches here are young families and men. We want to reach young families. We want to be a church that young families love to go. Where kids, you got to drag them out of kids' church because they love it so much. Where men walk in and go, yeah, this feels good. That's our focus. Those are our finches. In fact, you're going to see this mounted on the tree outside. So when you come into church, it's a reminder. Why do we exist? To move people to become fully devoted followers of Christ. To reach the lost, the unchurched, the de-churched. That's why we exist. But sometimes in the midst of that, we've got to figure out, what is God's plan for me? How do I fit into that big picture? What is my part of the puzzle? If you have your Bibles, I'm going to Exodus chapter 6. We're going Old Testament this morning. Love the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, it says, Say therefore, now this is God talking to Moses to tell the Egyptians. Are you with me? So God says this to Moses. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you. Say bring you. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will deliver you. Say deliver you. There you go. I will deliver you from the slavery to them and I will redeem you. Say redeem you. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment, and I will take you. Say, take you. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. If you study the Jewish law and the Jewish culture, you'll know exactly what I read. It's called the four cups of the Passover. Once a year, they sit down for the Passover celebration, and they will, they will take four cups of wine, and they will drink each cup, and they will re- remind themselves of this story that applies to us. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail this morning, but I am going to teach on it later on. But this morning, I kind of want to give you a snapshot as to what we're looking at and how our part fits into the big picture. The first is this. I will bring you out. It's salvation. See, God is a God of process, and what we see in this scripture is a process that applies to every one of us. That no matter where you're at on the journey, you could be here this morning, and you may not even believe that God exists. You may be here this morning, you may hate God. You may have shown up at this church, and you're bitter and frustrated, and that's okay. We're glad you're here. You may be at this church, and things have been going well for years, and everything's just coming together. The engine's firing on all cylinders, and that's wonderful. But I can tell you this, regardless of where you're at in life, God is a God of processes. And this morning, I want to show you this process. The first part is salvation. I will bring you out. I will save you. The second part is this. I will free you from being slaves. Deliverance. Now, hold on a second. Time out. Now, sometimes in our culture, when we hear the word deliverance, you either think about the TV show where they're shooting everybody, or you think about the crazy stuff where heads are spinning and somebody's vomiting. You know what I'm saying? Y'all hold, hold with me. Don't, don't get any preconceived notion when I talk about deliverance because I want to teach you something this morning, a part of the process. The third part of the process is I will redeem you. It's redemption. I am going to redeem you. And the fourth part is this. I will take you as my own people. It's fulfillment. The process that God walks us through, if we'll allow him to, if we'll surrender our lives to him, is very simple. Salvation, deliverance, redemption, and fulfillment. It's a process that all of us are going to walk through. And I want to show you what that looks like within the local body of Christ. Are you all with me this morning? Say amen. Amen. All right. I want to show you what that looks like in our body. First of all, salvation. Salvation for us, that's our weekend services. It's an opportunity to preach the gospel. We consider reaching people one of our greatest responsibilities as a church. 
Our weekend services serve people at all stages in their spiritual journey, but are primarily geared toward the lost and the unchurched. I don't make any bones about it. I'm not here to build up a yacht club. I'm not here to build up a bunch of people that want to sit on pews, sing their favorite song, say amen, and go home. That's not what we're here for. We're here to reach people. The purpose of our weekend services, because every church is a little bit different, you may go to a church that's to- come from a church that's totally different than this, and that's fine. But let me tell you what the purpose of our weekend services are here. Celebration. Celebration. I just went old school. Y'all like that? Celebration. Let me ask you a question. How many of you are introverts? Raise your hand. Some of you are like, is that a trick question? I'm raised. Introverts. What happens when you walk into a room full of people? The same thing extroverts do. You gaze through that room and you look for somebody you have something in common with. If you're a guest today, you probably did the same thing that I do when I'm a guest somewhere. I walk in and I look for somebody I might know or might look kind of like me. Pastor Dan and I went to a, a, a luncheon the other day for a community luncheon. And we walk in, it's, it's for like pastors, they invited all these pastors. And we look in and everybody's like in their 80s and then Pastor Dan and I are like, hey, what's up? And we walk in, first thing we do, we don't know anybody, we look around and go... Those guys look kind of like us. Let's go sit with them. (laughs) Because there's something about us we want to connect with people that we're similar to. There's something about us that we look for that, that safety net. When we come to church and celebrate, you have that safety net. Because let me tell you something really cool. You may not know this. But I don't know many of you. And you don't know me. Some of us have become friends. And you kind of know me pretty well. My wife knows me really well. We're all at different places in our relationship, but there's something we share in common. That if you have met Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life, and if you've made him the Lord of your life, let me tell you what we have in common. His name's Jesus. So when we come together on a Sunday, and we're celebrating, we're clapping, we're shouting, we're woo we're celebrating the fact that we have somebody in common that's worth celebrating over. Amen? So when we come together, our weekend services are about celebration. Secondly, it's about inspiration. I hope you come inspired, but let me, let me clarify what an inspiration is. Inspiration doesn't mean that you come in and then you walk out and go, well, that just felt pleasant. <laughs> Glory to God, I just feel so good about myself. If you're going to a church that's like that, you're going to the wrong church. Inspiration means it inspires you to be better. It inspires you to grow. So more often than not, you should walk out of church not going, oh, that was pleasant. You should walk out going, oh, that hurt. He done, he, done, he done stepped on me and kicked me in the rear end. Oh, my goodness, the gospel, it's hard. See, when we come to church, the purpose on a Sunday morning is to be inspired by the gospel, to change our lives, to become better men and better fathers, better husbands, to be better women, to be better mothers, to be better wives, to be better followers of Jesus Christ. When we walk out of here, we should be inspired. The third thing is preparation. See, the Bible says that the work of the church, the work of the pastor is to is to equip the saints. So when you come, you're getting preparation. Now, how many of you have ever come to a church service and you got absolutely nothing out of it? Raise your hand. That really hurts my feelings right now. Okay, talk about insecurities going through the roof. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. There's times that you may come and go, you know what, that, that really didn't hit me between the eyes. How many of you have been to a service where it's like Jesus is going, I'm talking to you. You know, many of you have called me and go, Pastor, were you, were you preaching right at me today? I'm like, no. No, I promise. There's times that the message is hitting us between the eyes. But then there's times where maybe, maybe it's not for us that day, but maybe it's for us to carry it to someone else. See, it's preparation. One of the greatest compliments that I can get is when somebody says, Pastor, I used that message today, and I was able to share it with so-and-so while they were cutting my hair. Or when I was at the grocery line, I was able to share with them some stuff that we talked about in church. Because church on a Sunday morning is about preparation. And the fourth thing is salvation. Salvation. Salvation is is a big key to what we do here. If you notice, it doesn't matter when it is or what's being talked about, there will always be an opportunity to meet Jesus at the end of the service. If if you're here this morning and and that scares you, I just want to prepare you. At the end of this service, I'm going to ask, if you want to know Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life, why don't you raise your hand and let me pray with you. I'm not going to bring you up front, hand you a mic, and ask you to do a song and a dance. I'm going to ask you to sit right where you're at. And ask you if you want to ask Jesus in your heart. Because see, Sunday morning, it's important. We're not here just to celebrate. We're not here just to be inspired. We're not here just to be prepared and provoked. But we're here so people can meet Jesus. Amen? Amen. But let me just clarify. It's not just the pastor's responsibility. You want to get me fired up? Look at me one day and go, it's your job. No, it is not. It is not my job. 
It is our job as believers. So how do you win people to Christ? I want to help you this morning. Maybe you're here and you're, you're not real comfortable with this conversation. That's good. Because the reality is less than 1% of Protestant believers have ever personally led someone to Christ. Statistics tell us, even in a church like ours, less than 50% of you in this room have invited someone to church in the past month. That's just the numbers. So let me help you this morning. How do you win people to Christ? How do you share your faith? The first thing is accept the personal responsibility. We've got to man up and accept the fact that it's our responsibility. It's not the preachers. It's not, it's not the, the evangelists. It's our job. It's our responsibility to share the gospel. The second thing is to build a personal relationship. Listen, friends, I've, I've done all the different evangelism classes and how to, how to present the gospel. Let me tell you the best way to present the gospel. Build a friendship with someone and share Jesus' love with them. We need to build relationships with people outside of the church. Build a relationship with your barber, with the person that's checking out your groceries, with with the person that works on your car. You build a relationship. And once there's a relationship, you share your personal story. Let me tell you what Jesus did in my life, man. Let me tell you what he saved me from. Let me tell you how he messed up my relationship with, with people. Let me tell you how he fixed my marriage. Let me tell you what Jesus did. Share your story and then give a personal invitation. For you, that may be, hey, let me, let me, can I pray with you right now? Maybe that invitation is, hey, come and see what God's doing at my church. Why don't you come to church with me? You can sit with me. You give a personal invitation. It's so simply accept the responsibility, build a personal relationship, share your personal story, and give a personal invitation. The second cup is deliverance. Now, let me, let me, let me, let me help you out this morning. Every single one of us, need to be delivered of something. See, a lot of times when we think of deliverance, we think of, you know, heads spinning and stuff we've seen in Hollywood and crazy stories and people dancing around with snakes and all that other stuff. Let me simplify it for you this morning. Deliverance is this. You've got junk in your life, and so do I. You've got baggage. You've been hurt. You've been stabbed in the back. You've been let down. You've had mess happen in your life, and you brought it in here this morning. You showed up to church thinking you were perfect and had it together, but a news flash, I'm busting the bubble that surrounds you. The reality is all of us are in a mess. Your marriages are in a mess. Your parenting styles are in a mess. Your finances are in a mess. Your lifestyles are in a mess. Our health is in a mess. Our relationship with Christ is in a mess. Anybody give me an amen on that one? Are we all in denial this morning? I'm calling it what it is. Because deliverance is not just being delivered from the big stuff. Man, we've got people in this room have been, who have been delivered from alcoholism. Praise God. We've got people in this room that have been delivered from drug addiction, pornography, everything you can imagine. But there's also people in this room that have been delivered from codependency, anger, fear. See, we've all got baggage, and God wants to deliver us from it. So let me tell you how that looks here at our church. That happens in our life groups. Now, for those of you that just went, whoa, that's scary. I'm definitely not going to a life group now. They have deliverance parties? No. No. (laughs) Deliverance happens at life groups because real life change happens in the context of relationships. Small groups. We believe that life change happens in the context of relationships. In the Bible, they worshiped in the temple, but ministry happened house to house. Why do you say that? Well, because... In our life groups, I can't speak for the other ones, so let me tell you about mine. In my life group, I've got people that their finances aren't great, and I've got people that their finances are strong. I've got people that their marriages aren't great, and I've got people who their marriages are strong. I've got people who are ready to kill their kids, and I've got people that are ready to kill their kids. And and, in our our life group, because I have a young family's life group, we're all in different places. But let me tell you what happens. When we have, in the context of relationships, we encourage each other, we provoke each other, and we grow together. We get delivered from the things that need to be delivered from because it happens in the context of relationships. People in my life group, again, I can't speak for the other ones, but I know it happens at the other ones. We'll have conversation. You'll see there's life group questions on the back of your bulletin. We'll sit there and have conversation about that. And what comes out many times is the reality. You know what? I need to grow in this area. I need to step up in this area. I need to do something different in this area. See, life groups provide three very important things. First of all, a place to connect. It's an opportunity to connect with people. I don't know about you, but I know that life is busy. 
You're constantly going. In, in our generation, and I'm speaking to the young people, so older people just tune me out for just a second. In my generation, we, they say we have the worst relationships of any generation. And the generation that's coming up is going to be even worse because we have a lot of acquaintances, but because of the age that we live in, we've learned how not to have in-depth friendships, relationships where we're vulnerable with one another, where we love one another. See, life groups give you an opportunity to get outside of the mundane and build godly relationships. Number two, it's a place to protect. 1 John 3.16 talks about love is being willing to lay down your life for one another. Can I just clarify that? Life groups are not a place where we put together like mafia groups and stuff, okay? But it is a place to where we protect one another. Let me, let me tell you what that looks like. See, I've gotten to know the people in my group. We've become friends. I know the guys and I know some of the things that they're struggling with. And because of the context of our conversation, I know things that they may be going through. So when something comes up that's going to attack them, something's going to come up that's going to make their lives difficult, now I have a relationship. I'm going to step in and go, hey, man, you better watch out for this. Hey, man, let me help you through this. I know this is about to happen. I know you're going through this. We're protecting one another. We're protecting the relationship. We're putting each other above ourselves. And the third thing that happens at life groups is it's a place to grow. It's a place to grow spiritually. It's a place to take it to the next level. It's a place to get provoked by the word of God and by conversation. See, again, deliverance, change, it happens in the context of relationships. Lasting change always works that way. The third cup this morning I want to talk about is the cup of redemption. See, when you've been delivered from something, when you've been set free, when you're coming out of something, redemption is you're walking into something better. I'm keeping this as simple as possible. For those of you that are theological scholars and you're like, well, preacher, you're leaving out a lot of really good Greek Hebrew. I know, but i got to keep it simple this morning. This morning, I want to talk about redemption also. That cup of redemption is part of that process that when we lay down parts of our lives that need to come out, the next thing to do is to pick up the stuff that we need. It's to grow. First Assembly offers the information and experiences necessary to help you discover and develop your redemptive process. The growth track that we're talking about is designed to lead you through a step-by-step process of growth and ownership. Because as we grow spiritually, how many of you know we take on responsibilities as well? If you've ever raised a child, I hope you don't give your 5-year-old the responsibility you give a 16-year-old. That would be bad parenting. Y'all with me? As we grow and mature, so comes the responsibility and so comes the responsibility. There's ownership in everything. Hebrews 6.1 says this. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. Not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. That sounds good, don't it? I mean, that's just... Therefore, let us leave the elementary things. Sounds very sophisticated. Well, I'm not very sophisticated, so let me simplify. It means grow the heck up. It means it's time to stop sipping on the bottle. If you've got to part the mustache to get the milk, it's time to grow up. Are you hearing me this morning? The problem is, is in church life, we get so used to the easy stuff, don't we? See, I I got too many religious people this morning. We get so used to let the pastor feed me. Let, let Let the Sunday school director, let them feed me. Let me just sit back and receive. And what happens is we become fat Christians. I'm just giving it to you straight this morning. We become fat Christians, but the Bible says, grow up. Therefore, leave the childish thing, leave the baby stuff, and let's move on and grow up in maturity. The Bible actually says, for for those of you that are wondering, it says at some point you've got to leave the milk. And we've got to move on to some substance. The growth track is to help in that process of provoking you in your growth. Because sometimes we get stagnant. Anybody ever get stagnant? Okay, I'm going I'm to I'm talk to myself because y'all aren't very fun to preach to this morning. Hey, you ever get stagnant? I get stagnant. Sometimes I just get dull and I, I get ca- caught in a rut and, and I don't know where I'm going and the wheels are spinning. That's why we've created a thing called First Assembly University. This week you're in the first class in a very abbreviated version of it where we talk about church 101. That's today. We're talking about the basic introduction to the ministry of First Assembly, why we do what we do, why we are who we are, what our purpose, our values, our mission is, who our finches are. This is about our church, and it's going to be held on the first Sunday of every month. The second class that we're going to do is Essentials 201. 
Next week, I'm going to walk you through that. We're going to talk about what it looks like to be a growing believer. What you have to do to provoke yourself. How do you feed yourself? Because can I be honest with you? My job is not to always spoon feed you. My job is to help put the food on the table. And your job is to walk up and go, oh, this is good stuff. But I can't spoon feed you forever. See, we have to learn how to feed ourselves. You know the old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. How about the old saying, you can, you, can teach, you can give a man a fish, feed him for a day. You can teach him to fish and feed him for a lifetime. That's what Essentials 201 is all about. Discovery 301. In this class, we're going to devour, we're going to discover our personality, our gifts, our purpose in life, and see how God combines them for the best fit in ministry. Discovery 301 is always going to be on the third Sunday. We're going to help you figure out how God wired you. We're going to help you figure out what God has gifted you in. We're going to help figure it out so that you can be walking into that place of fulfillment that we'll get to in a moment. And then the fourth class is Dream Team 401. Dream Team 401, we're going to explain to you and we're going to show you what it looks like to get involved in ministry and to take ownership. See, God's ultimate goal for your life is to make an eternal difference in the life of another person. Let me say that again. God's ultimate goal for you And your life is to make an internal difference in the life of another person. Well, pastor, isn't God's goal for my life for me to get saved? Well, if that was the case, you'd give your heart to Christ and poof, you're gone. But yet you're still here for some reason. Because see, after you give your heart to Christ, he has got a purpose for you. And if you don't figure out that purpose, you're going to live a life of frustration. That's why we're going to walk into our fourth cup, fulfillment. Fulfillment. Fulfillment for us is our dream team. All of us were created by God to make a difference. Can somebody say amen to that? All of us. You were created to make a difference. You were not created to just work a job, just to pay bills, just to raise kids, just to survive marriage or enjoy marriage, whatever case you may be in this morning. You were created to function in those areas and to move forward and change people's lives. That's what the dream team's all about. See, God is a place for you where your unique abilities and passions can touch the lives of others. We believe that your life will never make sense. Hear me. We believe your life will never make sense until you find, develop, and fulfill that purpose that God intends for you. Now, you may think I'm crazy, so let me give you some scripture. Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Acts 20.24. But I do not count my life of any value nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. 1 Corinthians 12.4-5. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit, and the varieties of service, but the same Lord. 1 Corinthians 12.26. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. You have got a role within the body to make a difference in the world. Are you with me this morning? See, let me be very clear as to how we how we function here, what we believe. We believe without a doubt at First Assembly, every partner is a minister. Now you may be here and go, Pastor, I don't feel like I'm capable of being a minister. That's a lie from hell. You were created by God to make a difference in this world. We believe everybody is a, mem- is a minister. We believe every task is important. You may be one that your, your gifting is to stand on a stage behind a pulpit and preach the gospel. You may be one that's going on to the mission field. You may be one that's leading worship. Th- those are the ones that everybody looks at and go, oh, that's great. But let me tell you something. Every single task is important. If it wasn't for the people making coffee, you wouldn't have had coffee this morning. If it wasn't for the people that cleaned this church, you would have walked into an even bigger mess this morning than from all the stuff we've done. If it wasn't for the people that are helping update and upgrade this building, can you imagine if it wasn't for the people that are prayer warriors in this place that have covered me and this church in prayers for years? Every task is important. And number three, everyone is a 10 in some area. Everybody's a 10 in some area. I don't care who you are. You've got something you're great at and God has gifted you for. You're going to see us walk through our dream team quite a bit. In fact, this morning, I need you to do me a huge favor. Can you, can you do me something? If you've not been taking notes, that's fine. Nobody's going to check them. But in the pew back in front of every single one of you, front row people, just, y'all just relax. This doesn't apply to y'all right now. Y'all get paper later. In the pew back, seat back in front of you, you'll see a little white piece of paper. Pull that out for me. Everybody get it? Wave it at me. If your neighbor doesn't have one, kick them, wake them up, tell them to get a piece of paper. Pinch them. 
you need to. Sorry, we didn't, you don't have a seat back. I don't have anywhere to put the paper. Sorry. <laughs> we'll get you paper in a minute. I want you to write your name down on that piece of paper. I want you to write your name down. Okay, why are you writing your name down? Well, you're signing up for a petition you didn't even know about. It. I'm getting a raise. Thank God. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. The reason I'm asking you to do that is because we take so much value in what we're doing this month. That our greatest desire is not just to teach you. I had, a, I, had, I had a great series planned for this month. I was so excited. But the Lord said, no, I, I want to do something different. We believe in what we're sharing with you today in this month. So much that we want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to walk through the process. So basically what I'm asking you to do is to write your name down. We're going to collect it after church. You can put it right back. Because I need to know who was here today. Because our goal is to walk everybody through this process. Well, pastor, I don't want you to know I was here today. Well, that's, you're just being difficult. Stop. <laughs> just write your name down. Put it in the, in the seat back. Because we need to know who's been to what class, okay? And if you miss a class, we'll have some makeups. But I want to know who has been a part of what, what's happening. I want to know, make sure people don't get lost. Because so many times as a church grows, people get lost in the cracks. And, oh, we don't want that. We want to be able to connect with everyone. So please, if you don't mind, just sign your name. Put it back in that seat. This morning we're talking about the church, and I've got one more part. I've got one more part I want to share with you, and it's about the structure of the church here. See, we talked about how we do what we do. We talked about what we do. We talked about why we do. I want to talk to you for just a second about the structure of a church. See, in this room, we've got some very unique people. Some of you are a little weird, but we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> See... In our church, I was talking to a great couple this weekend I met, and they were asking about First Assembly, and it was awesome. I was able to share with them that this church is full of so many different people. We've got Catholics in the room. We've got people that have grown up Baptist and Methodist and Pentecostal and ultra-Pentecostal. We've got charismatic this, charismatic that. We've got, we've got people that have grown up atheists. We've got people that are here this morning that they don't believe Jesus exists, and that's great. We've got every type of a person you can imagine in this church. I don't think we have snake handlers. If you're a snake handler, just don't tell me. That's just, I draw the line there. We've got every type of personality you can imagine here. And we also live in a society where we're hearing all kinds of stuff on the news about this pastor, that, that church, this. So I, I want to share this with you because it's a part of Church 101. But also, I want to know, I want you to know how we do things here and why we do it the way we do it. 1 Corinthians 14, says, For God is not a God of confusion, but a God of peace. As in all the churches of the saints. 1 Corinthians 14, 40 says, But all things should be done decently and in order. If you're new here and there's many people that you're very new to this church, can, can I just share with you how we do things here? We have believers who invest their hearts, time, families, and finances in building the local church. And they deserve and you deserve to have confidence in what happens here. People are looking for leaders who conduct themselves with integrity and respect and making decisions that affect their lives. So at our church, we're a church that's guided by pastors. Guided by pastors. The pastoral staff team is led by me. Uh, we oversee the day-to-day -day ministry and operations of the church. We serve the congregation who are responsible for the development of spiritual life of the church. But we're also strengthened by a board. We've got some great board members here. And I think everybody's here. If you're a board member here, raise your hand so I know who you are. Oh, yeah. Hey, thanks for being on the team. Right here, right here. We got everybody. Got some, we've got a great team here that helps strengthen the board, strengthen the body. They consist of up to six individuals from within this body who are appointed to serve, protect, and lead. So why am I telling you all that? Some of you are here and you're like, Pastor, I don't give a rip. I just come for the free coffee. Some of you are here and you're like, you know, I, I just come because I've always come. I really don't care and all that stuff. No, don't put your notes up. You're not done. <laughs> I tricked you. The reason I'm telling you that is, one, because I get asked a lot, and two, because it's part of the body. This morning, we're talking about the body of Christ. See, the Bible says the body is one body, but with multiple members. We all have a part. There's hands, there's feet, there's legs, there's a little bit of everything. Jesus Christ is the head of the church, but we're the part of the body. I wanted you to know what the body was about, and I want you to know how the body runs. But more importantly, I want you to write this down, because this is where you come in. I want you to write these words. What is my part? Don't put your notes up yet. Write that down. Just anywhere. What is my part? See, we come together and we talk about the church and we talk about leadership and structure. We can talk about purpose and mission. But when it's all said and done, the reality is, is you, you, me, us, 
We have to figure out what our part of the body is. Because you don't just exist. You don't just come and sit. You're a part of something. You're a part of something that's bigger than you. Thank God. We're a part of something that that is a living organism. It's not a machine. It's not a business. It's a living creature. The body of Christ. The church. So what is your part of it? Tonight, if you're a part of a small group or maybe your group meets tomorrow, you're going to be a part of a discussion where we talk about what our part is in the body of Christ. Because all of us are on different places in the journey, but all of us are on the same road if we've accepted Jesus. So let me ask you again. What is your part? What is your part? This morning, I want to ask you a question. If you'll do me a favor, I, I, just, just appease me for just a moment. Will you just bow your head and close your eyes? See, this room has got a lot of new people. It's got a lot of people that have been here a while, and that really doesn't matter. Because this morning, my question is to all of us. This morning, you found yourself at First Assembly for whatever reason, and I'm glad you're here. So I just need to ask. When we talk about the body of Christ and when we talk about being a part of something bigger than us, when we talk about the process that God not only walks us as individuals through, but also makes available for the church as a whole, the four cups, we talk about these things, but you sit there maybe in this morning and, and you feel like, I'm not a part of this. Not just First Assembly. This isn't about joining our church. This is about being a part of the body of Christ. Because see, the very first step is that first cup, salvation. I'm not going to ask you to stand or move or anything. I'm just going to ask you very simply, right where you're at. If you came this morning and you'd say, Pastor, I don't know Jesus. I don't know him in a way that you're talking about. I don't have a relationship. I don't feel like I'm part of this body, part of a body. I don't feel like, I, I feel like I'm the outsider looking in. If that's you this morning, can I just tell you that when you ask Jesus to come into your heart, your past is wiped away. We say around here, you've made a fresh start. If that's you this morning, I just want you right where you're at just to simply, simply slip up your hand. Pastor, that's me. I'd like, I see your hand right here. Who else? If that's you, just raise your hand right where you're at. Nobody's going to call you up. Just right where you're at. Pastor, I'd like to make a fresh start. Just slip up your hand so I can see you. Who else? All right. This morning, maybe you raised your hand, maybe you didn't, and you wish you had. I understand. But can we all just pray together? Dear Jesus. I know I'm not perfect. In fact, I'm a sinner. But I want to be a part of you. Will you come into my life? Wipe away my past. Today I want to make a fresh start. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask you with every head bowed and every eye closed, just right where you're at, I want to pray for you this morning. And I want you to think about that last question. What is my part? Because I'm going to pray in just a moment that God would start stirring you. Because I believe he wants more from all of us. Part of that fulfillment is figuring that out. I don't know where you're at in the process, but I do know this. That Jesus is madly in love with you. Let me pray. Father, I thank you so much for this day. God, I thank you for the incredible people you allow us to lead at this church. God, I thank you for the incredible people that call this home as well as the guests that are here today. God, I thank you that you're a God that still changes lives. Father, this morning I pray that you would, you would challenge us. God, as we ask ourselves the hard questions, that we would, we would be challenged by your word, that we would look at the reality of who we are and where we're struggling, where we're missing it, that we would look at the four cups and recognize that there's a process, not just for us as individuals, but us as a body. Lord, I pray that you would just challenge us to be the men and women of God you've called us to be. That when we fall madly in love with you, we fall madly in love with the church because it's your body. Father, use us as your hands and feet. Use us this week, not just here in this building, but in this community to make a difference in the lives that you've placed around us. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing and we thank you for who you are. We give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. In Jesus' mighty and perfect name we pray. Amen and amen. Can you just thank him this morning? Father, we thank you so much.